Chapter Seven of Romulus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. Romulus by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Seven. Rhea Silvia, B.C. Eight Hundred. Rhea Silvia, the mother of Romulus, was a Vestal Virgin who lived in the kingdom of Latium about four hundred years after the death of Aeneas. A Vestal Virgin was a sort of priestess who was required, like the nuns of modern times, to live in seclusion from the rest of the world, and devote their time wholly and without reserve to the services of religion. They were, like nuns, especially prohibited from all association and intercourse with men. Aeneas himself is said to have founded the order of Vestal Virgins, and to have instituted the rites and services which were committed to their charge. These rites and services were in honor of Vesta, who was the goddess of home. The fireside has been, in all ages and countries, the center and the symbol of home, and the worship of Vesta consisted, accordingly, of ceremonies designed to dignify and exalt the fireside in the estimation of the people. Instead of the images and altars which were used in the worship of the other deities, a representation of a fire stand was made, such as were used in the houses of those days, and upon this sacred stand a fire was kept continually burning, and various rites and ceremonies were performed in connection with it, in honor of the domestic virtues and enjoyments, of which it was the type and symbol. These fire stands, as used by the ancients, were very different from the fireplaces of modern times which are recesses and chimneys with flues above for the passage of the smoke. The household fires of the ancients were placed in the center of the apartment, on a hearth or supporter called the focus. This hearth was made sometimes of stone or brick, and sometimes of bronze. The smoke escaped above, through openings in the roof. This would seem, according to the ideas of the present day, a very comfortless arrangement, but it must be remembered that the climate in those countries was mild, and there was accordingly but little occasion for fire, and then, besides, such were the habits of the people at this period of the world, that not only their pursuits and avocations, but far the greater portion of their pleasures, called them into the open air. Still, the fireplace was, with them as with us, the type and emblem of domestic life, and accordingly, in paying divine honors to Vesta, the goddess of home, they set up a focus, or fireplace, in her temple instead of an altar and in the place of sacrifices they simply kept burning upon it a perpetual fire the priestesses who had charge of the fire were selected for this purpose when they were children it was required that they should be from six to ten years of age when chosen they were consecrated to the service of vesta by the most solemn ceremonies and as virgins were bound under awful penalties to spotless purity of life as the perpetual fire in the temple of Vesta represented the fire of the domestic hearth, so these Vestal virgins represented the maidens by whom the domestic service of a household is performed. And the life of seclusion and celibacy, which was required of them, was the emblem of the innocence and purity which the institution of the family is expressly intended to guard. The duties of the Vestals were analogous to those of domestic maidens. They were to watch the fire, and never to allow it to go out. They were to perform various rites and ceremonies connected with the worship of Vesta, and to keep the interior of the temple and the shrines pure and clean, and the sacred vessels and utensils arranged, as in a well-ordered household. In a word, they were to be, in purity, in industry, in neatness, in order, and in patience and vigilance, the perfect impersonation of maidenly virtue as exhibited in its own proper field of duty at home. The most awful penalties were visited upon the head of any Vestal Virgin who was guilty of violating her vows. There is no direct evidence what these penalties were at this early period, but in subsequent years, at Rome, where the Vestal Virgins resided, the man who was guilty of enticing one of them away from her duty was publicly scourged to death in the Roman Forum. For the Vestal herself, thus led away, a cell was dug beneath the ground and vaulted over. A pit led down to the subterranean dungeon, entering it by one side. In the dungeon itself there was placed a table, a lamp, and a little food. The descent was by a ladder which passed down through the pit. The place of this terrible preparation for punishment was near one of the gates of the city, and when all was ready, the unhappy vessel was brought forth, 
at the head of a great public procession, she herself being attended by her friends and relatives, all mourning and lamenting her fate by the way. The ceremony, in a word, was in all respects a funeral, except that the person who was to be buried was still alive. On arriving at the spot, the wretched criminal was conducted down the ladder and placed upon the couch in the cell. The assistants who performed the service then returned. The ladder was drawn up, earth was drawn in until the pit was filled, and the erring girl was left to her fate, which was, when her lamp had burned out, and her food was expended, to starve by slow degrees, and die at last in darkness and despair. If we would do full justice to the ancient founders of civilization and empire, we should probably consider their enshrinement of Vesta, and the contriving of the ceremonies and observances which were instituted in honor of her, not as the setting up of an idol or false god, for worship, in the sense in which Christian nations worship the spiritual and eternal Jehovah, but rather as the embodiment of an idea, a principle, as the best means, in those rude ages, of attracting to it the general regard. Even in our own days, and in Christian lands, men erect a pole in honor of liberty, and surmount it with the image of a cap. And if, instead of the cap, they were to place a carved effigy of liberty above, and to assemble for periodical celebrations below, with games and music and banners, we should not probably call them idolaters. So Christian poets write odes and invocations to peace, to disappointment, to spring, to beauty, in which they impersonate an idea or a principle, and address it in the language of adoration, as if it were a sentient being, possessing magical and mysterious powers. In the same manner, the rites and celebrations of ancient times are not necessarily all to be considered as idolatry, and denounced as inexcusably wicked and absurd. Our fathers set up an image in honor of liberty to strengthen the influence of the love of liberty on the popular mind. It is possible that Aeneas looked upon the subject in the same light, in erecting a public fireside in honor of domestic peace and happiness, and in designated maidens to guard it with constant vigilance and with spotless purity. At all events, the institution exercised a vast and an incalculable power in impressing the minds of men, in those rude ages, with a sense of the sacredness of the domestic tie, and in keeping before their minds a high standard, in theory at least, of domestic honor and purity. We must remember that they had not then the word of God, nor any means of communicating to the minds of the people any general enlightenment and instruction. They were obliged, therefore, to resort to the next best method which their ingenuity could devise. There were a great many very extraordinary rites and ceremonies connected with the service of the Vestal Altar, and many singular regulations for the conduct of it, the origin and design of which it would now be very difficult to ascertain. As has already been remarked, the virgins were chosen when very young, being, when designated to the office, not under six nor over ten years of age. They were chosen by the king, and it was necessary that the candidate, besides the above-named requisite in regard to age, should be in a perfect condition of soundness and health in respect to all her bodily limbs and members, and also to the faculties of her mind. It was required, too, that she should be the daughter of free and free-born parents, who had never been in slavery, and had never followed any menial or degrading occupation, and also that both her parents should be living. To be an orphan was considered, it seems, in some sense an imperfection. The service of the Vestal Virgins continued for thirty years, and when this period had expired, the maidens were discharged from their vows, and were allowed, if they chose, to lay aside their Vestal robes and the other emblems of their office, and return to the world, with the privilege even of marrying if they chose to do so. Though the laws, however, permitted this, there was a public sentiment against it, and it was seldom that any of the Vestal priestesses availed themselves of the privilege. They generally remained, after their term of service had expired, in attendance at the temple, and died as they had lived in the service of the goddess. One of the chief functions of the virgins, in their service to the temple, was to keep the sacred fire perpetually burning. This fire was never to go out, and if, by any neglect on the part of the Vestal in attendance, this was allowed to occur, the guilty maiden was punished terribly by scourging. The punishment was inflicted by the hands of the highest pontifical officer of the state. The laws of the institution, however, evinced their high regard for the purity and modesty of the Vestal maidens, by requiring that the blows should be administered in the dark, the sufferer having been previously prepared to receive them by being partially undressed by her female attendants.
The extinguished fire was then rekindled with many solemn ceremonies. Rhea Silvia, the mother of Romulus, was, we repeat, a vestal virgin. She lived four hundred years after the death of Aeneas. During these four centuries, the kingdom had been governed by the descendants of Aeneas, generally in a peaceful and prosperous manner, although some difficulties occurred in the establishment of the succession immediately after Aeneas's death. It will be remembered that Aeneas was drowned during the continuance of the war. He left one son, and perhaps others. The one who figured most conspicuously in the subsequent history of the kingdom was Ascanius, the son who had accompanied Aeneas from Troy, one who now attained to years of maturity. He, of course, on his father's death, immediately succeeded him. There is some question, however, whether, after all, Lavinia herself was not entitled to the kingdom. It was doubtful, according to the laws and usages of those days, whether Aeneas held the realm in his own right, or as the husband of Lavinia, who was the daughter and heir of Latinus, the ancient and legitimate king. Lavinia, however, seemed to have no disposition to assert her claim. She was of a mild and gentle spirit, and besides, her health was at that time such as to lead her to wish for retirement and repose. She even had some fears for her personal safety, not knowing but that Ascanius would be suspicious and jealous of her on account of her claims to the throne, and that he might be tempted to do her some injury. Her husband had been her only protector among the Trojans, and now, since he was no more, and another, who was in some sense her rival, had risen to power, she naturally felt insecure. She accordingly took the first opportunity to retire from Lavinium. She went away into the forest in the interior of the country, with very few attendants and friends, and concealed herself there in a safe retreat. The family that received and sheltered her was that of Tereus, the chief of her father's shepherds, whose children stag Ascanius had formerly killed. Here, in a short time, she had a son. She determined to name him from his father, and in order to commemorate his having been born in the midst of the wild forest scenes which surrounded her at the time of his birth, she called him in full Aeneas of the Woods, or, as it was expressed in the language which was then used in Latium, Aeneas Silvius. The boy, when he grew up, was always known by this name in subsequent history. And not only did he himself retain the name, but he transmitted it to his posterity, for all the kings that afterwards descended from him, extending in a long line through a period of four hundred years, had the word Silvius affixed to their names, in perpetual commemoration of the romantic birth of their ancestor. Rhea, the mother of Romulus, of whom we have already spoken, and of whom we shall presently have occasion to speak still more, was Rhea Silvia, by reason of her having been by birth a princess of this royal line. Ascanius, in the meantime, on the death of his father, who was for a time so engrossed in the prosecution of the war, that he paid but little attention to the departure of Lavinia. The name of the king of the Rutulians who fought against him was Mezentius. Mezentius had a son named Lausus, and both father and son were personally serving in the army by which Ascanius was besieged in Lavinium. Mezentius had command in the camp, in the headquarters of the army, which was at some distance from the city. Lausus headed an advanced guard, which had established itself strongly at a post which they had taken near the gates. In this state of things, Ascanius, one dark and stormy night, planned a sortie. He organized a desperate body of followers, and after watching the flashes of lightning for a time, to find omens from them indicating success, he gave the signal. The gates were opened, and the column of armed men sallied forth, creeping noiselessly forward in the darkness and gloom, until they came to the encampment of Lausus. They fell upon this camp with an irresistible rush, and with terrific shouts and outcries. The whole detachment were taken entirely by surprise, and great numbers were made prisoners or slain. Lausus himself was killed. Excited by their victory, the Trojan soldiers, headed by Ascanius, now turned their course toward the main body of the Rutulian army. Mezentius had, however, in the meantime, obtained warning of their approach, and when they reached his camp he was ready to retreat. He fled with all his forces toward the mountains. Ascanius and the Trojans followed him. Mezentius halted and attempted to fortify himself on a hill. Ascanius surrounded the hill and soon compelled his enemies to come to terms. A treaty was made, and Mezentius and his forces soon after withdrew from the country, leaving Ascanius and Latium in peace. Ascanius then, after having in some degree settled his affairs, began to think of Lavinia, 
in fact the latin portion of his subjects seemed disposed to murmur and complain at her having been compelled to withdraw from her own paternal kingdom in order to leave the throne to the occupancy of the son of a stranger some even feared that she had come to some harm or that ascanius might in the end put her to death when time had been allowed for the recollection of her to pass in some degree from the minds of men so the public began generally to call for lavinia's return ascanius seems to have been well disposed to do justice in the case for he not only sought out lavinia and induced her to return to the capital with her little son but he finally concluded to give up lavinium to her entirely as her own rightful dominion while he went away and founded a new city for himself he accordingly explored the country around for a favorable site and at length decided upon a spot nearly north of lavinium and not many miles distant from it the place which he marked out for the walls of the city was at the foot of a mountain on a tract of somewhat elevated ground which formed one of the lower declivities of it the mountain arising abruptly on one side formed a sure defense on that side on the other side was a small lake of clear and pellucid water in front and somewhat below there were extended plains of fertile land ascanius after having determined on this place as the site of his intended city set his men to work to make the necessary constructions some built the walls of the city and laid out streets and erected houses within others were employed in forming the declivity of the mountain above into terraces for the cultivation of the vine the slopes which they thus graded had a southern exposure and the grapes which subsequently grew there were luxurious and delicate in flavor from the little lake channels were cut leading over the plains below and by this means a constant supply of water could be conveyed to the fields of grain which were to be sown there for purposes of irrigation thus the place which ascanius chose furnished all possible facilities both for maintaining and also for defending the people who were to make it their abode the town was called alba longa that is long alba it was called long to distinguish it from another alba it was really long in its form as the buildings extended for a considerable distance along the border of the lake ascanius reigned over thirty years at alba longa while lavinia reigned at lavinium each friendly to the other and governing the country at large together in peace and harmony in process of time both died ascanius left a son whose name was ulus while aeneas silvius was lavinia's heir there was of course great diversity of opinion throughout the nation in regard to the comparative claims of these two princes respectively some maintained that aeneas the trojan became by conquest the rightful sovereign of latium regardless of any of the rights that he acquired through his marriage with lavinia and that ulus as the son of his eldest son rightfully succeeded him others contended that lavinium represented the ancient and truly legitimate royal line and that aeneas silvius as her son and heir ought to be placed upon the throne and there were those who proposed to compromise the question by dividing latium into two separate kingdoms giving up one part to aeolus with alba longa for its capital and the other with lavinium for its capital to aeneas silvius lavinia's heir this proposition was however overruled the two kingdoms thus formed would be small and feeble it was thought and unable to defend themselves against the other italian nations in case of war the question was finally settled by a different sort of compromise it was agreed that latium should retain its integrity and that aeneas silvius being the son both of aeneas and lavinia and thus representing both branches of the reigning power should be the king while Ulus and his descendants forever should occupy the position scarcely less inferior of sovereign power in matters of religion aeneas silvius therefore and his descendants became kings and as such commanded the armies and directed the affairs of state while Ulus and his family were exalted in connection with them to the highest pontifical dignities this state of things once established continued age after age and century after century for about four hundred years no records and very few traditions in respect to what occurred during this period remain one circumstance however took place which caused itself to be remembered there was one king in the line of the sylvii whose name was tiberinus in one of his battles with the armies of the nation adjoining him on the northern side he attempted to swim across the river that formed the frontier he was forced down by the current and was seen no more 
By the accident, however, he gave the name of Tiber to the stream, and thus perpetuated his own memory through the subsequent renown of the river in which he was drowned. Before this time the river was called the Albula. Another incident is related, which is somewhat curious, as illustrating the ideas and customs of the times. One of this Sylvian line of sovereigns was named Aladius. This Aladius conceived the idea of making the people believe that he was a god, and in order to accomplish the sin he resorted to the contrivance of imitating, by artificial means, the sound of the rumbling of thunder and the flashes of lightning at night from his palace on the banks of the lake at Alba Longa. He employed, probably for this purpose, some means similar to those resorted to for the same end in theatrical spectacles at the present day. The people, however, were not deceived by this imposture, though they soon after fell into an error nearly as absurd as believing in this false thunder would have been, for on an occasion which occurred not long afterward, probably that of a great storm accompanied with torrents of rain upon the mountains around, the lake rose so high as to produce an inundation, in which the water broke into the palace, and the pretended thunderer was drowned. The people considered that he was destroyed thus by the special interposition of heaven, to punish him for his impiety and daring to assume what was then considered the peculiar attribute and prerogative of supreme divinity. In fact, the rumor circulated, and one historian has recorded it as true, that Aladius was struck by the lightning which accompanied the storm, and thus killed at once by the terrible agency which he had presumed to counterfeit, before the inundation of the palace came on. If he met his death in any sudden and unusual manner, it is not at all surprising that his fate should have been attributed to the judgment of God, for thunder was regarded in those days with an extreme and superstitious veneration and awe. All this is, however, now changed. Men have learned to understand thunder and to protect themselves from its power, and now, since Franklin and Morse have commenced the work of subduing the potent and mysterious agent in which it originates to the human will, the presumption is not very strong against the supposition that the time may come when human science may actually produce it in the sky, as it is now produced, in effect, upon the lecturer's table. At last, toward the close of the four hundred years during which the dynasty of the Silvia continued to reign over Latium, a certain monarch of the series died, leaving two children, Numitor and Amulius. Numitor was the eldest son, and as such entitled to succeed his father, but he was of a quiet and somewhat inefficient disposition, while his younger brother was ardent and ambitious, and very likely to aspire to the possession of power. The father, it seems, anticipated the possibility of dissension between his sons after his death, and in order to do all in his power to guard against it, he endeavored to arrange and settle the succession before he died. In the course of the negotiations which ensued, Amulius proposed that his father's possessions should be divided into two portions, the kingdom to constitute one, and the wealth and treasures the other, and that Numitor should choose which portion he would have. This proposal seemed to have the appearance, at least, of reasonableness and impartiality, and it would have been really very reasonable if the right to the inheritance thus disposed of had belonged equally to the younger and to the elder son, but it did not and thus the author of Amulius was, in effect, a proposition to divide with himself that which really belonged wholly to his brother. Numitor, however, who, it seems, was little disposed to contend for his rights, agreed to this proposal. He, however, chose the kingdom and left the wealth for his brother, and the inheritance was accordingly thus divided on the death of the father. But Amulius, as soon as he came into possession of his treasures, began to employ them as a means of making powerful friends, and strengthening his political influence. In due time he usurped the throne, and Numitor, giving up the contest with very little attempt to resist usurpation, fled and concealed himself in some obscure place of retreat. He had, however, two children, a son and a daughter, which he left behind him in his flight. Amulius feared that these children might, at some future time, give him trouble by advancing claims as their father's heirs. He did not dare to kill them openly, for fear of exciting the popular odium against himself. He was obliged, therefore, to resort to stratagem. The son, whose name was Augustus, he caused to be slain at a hunting party by employing remorseless and desperate men to shoot him in the heat of the chase with arrows or thrust him through with a spear, watching their opportunity for doing this at a moment when they were not observed, or when it might appear to be an accident. The daughter, whose name was Rhea, the Rhea Silvia named at the commencement of this chapter, he could not well actually destroy, without being known to be her murderer, 
and perhaps too he had enough remaining humanity to be unwilling to shed the blood of a helpless and beautiful maiden the daughter too of his own brother then besides he had a daughter of his own named antho who was the playmate and companion of rhea and with whose affection for her cousin he must have felt some sympathy he would not therefore destroy the child but contented himself with determining to make her a vestal virgin by this means she would be solemnly set apart to a religious service from aspiring to the throne and by being cut off by her vestal vows from all possibility of forming any domestic ties she could never he thought have any offspring to dispute his claim to the throne there was nothing very extraordinary in this consecration of his niece princess as she was to the service of the vestal fire for it had been customary for children of the highest rank to be designated to this office the little rhea for she was yet a child when her uncle took this determination in respect to her made as it would appear no objection to what she perhaps considered a distinguished honour the ceremonies therefore of her consecration were duly performed she took the vows and bound herself by the most awful sanctions unconscious however perhaps herself of what she was doing to lead thenceforth a life of absolute celibacy and seclusion she was then received into the temple of vesta and there with the other maidens who had been consecrated before her she devoted herself to the discharge of the duties of her office without reproach for several years at length however certain circumstances occurred which suddenly terminated rhea's career as a vestal virgin and led to results of the most momentous character what these circumstances were will be explained in the next chapter End of chapter 7eight of romulus this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by simon wainwright romulus by jacob abbott chapter eight the twins b c seven seven four through seven five five although the temple of vista itself at alba longa was the principal scene of the duties which developed upon the vestal versions still they were not wholly confined in their avocations to that sacred edifice but were often called upon one or two at a time to perform services or to assist in the celebration of rites at other places in the city and vicinity there was a temple consecrated to mars near alba it was situated in the opening of the woods in some little glen or valley at the base of the mountain there was a stream of water running through the ground and rhea in the performance of her duties as a vestal was required at one time to pass to and fro through the grooves in this solitary place to fetch water here she allowed herself in violation of her vestal vows to form the acquaintance of a man whom she met in the groves she knew well that by doing so she made herself subject to the most dreadful penalties in case her fault should become known still she yielded to the temptation and allowed herself to be persuaded to remain with the stranger she said afterward when the facts were brought to light that her meeting with this companion was wholly unintentional on her part she saw a wolf in the grove she said and she ran terrified into a cave to escape from him and that the man came to her there to protect her and then compelled her to remain with him besides from his dress and countenance and air she had believed him she said to be the god mars himself and thought that it was not her duty to resist his will however this may be 
her stolen interview or interviews with this stranger were not known at the time and rhea perhaps thought that her fault would never be discovered some weeks after this however it was observed by her companions and friends that she began to appear thoughtful and depressed her dejection interest day by day her face became wan and pale and her eyes were often filled with tears they asked her what was the cause of her trouble she said she was sick she was soon afterward excused from her duties in the vestal temple and went away and remained for some time shut up in retirement and seclusion there at length two children twins were born to her it was thought through the influence of antho rhea's cousin that the unhappy vestal was not put to death by amulius before her children were born at the time when her fault was first discovered the laws of the state in respect of vestal versions which were inexorably severe would have justified him in causing her to be executed at once but antho interceded so earnestly for her unhappy cousin that amulius for a time spared her life when however her sons were born the anger of amulius broke out anew if she had remained childless he would have probably allowed her to live though she could of course never be restored to her office in the temple of vesta or if she had given birth to a daughter she might have been pardoned since a daughter on account of her sex would have been little likely to disturb amulius in the possession of the kingdom but the existence of two sons born directly in the line of the succession and each of them having claims superior to his own endangered most eminently he perceived his possession of power he was of course greatly enraged he caused rhea to be shut up in close imprisonment and as for the boys he ordered them to be thrown into the tiber the tiber was at some considerable distance from alba but it was probably near the place where rhea had resided in her retirement and where the children were born a peasant of that region was entrusted with the task of throwing the children into the river whether his official duty in undertaking this commission required him actually to drown the boys or whether he was allowed to give the helpless babes some little chance for their lives is not known at all events he determined that in committing the children to the stream he would so arrange it that they should float away from his sight in order that he might not himself be a witness of their dying struggles and cries he accordingly put them upon a species of float that he made a sort of box or trough as would seem from the ancient descriptions which he had hollowed out from a log and disposing their little limbs carefully within this narrow receptacle he pushed the frail boat with its navigators still more frail out upon the current of the river the name of the peasant who performed this task was faustulus the peasant also who subsequently as will hereafter appear found and took charge of the children is spoken of by the ancient historians as faustulus too in fact we might well suppose that no man however rustic and rude could give his time and his thoughts to two such babes long enough 
to make an ark for them for the purpose of making it possible to save their lives and then place them carefully in it to send them away without becoming so far interested in their fate and so touched by their mute and confiding helplessness as to feel prompted to follow the stream to see how so perilous a navigation would end we have however no direct evidence that faustulus did so watch the progress of his boat down the river the story is that it was drifted along now whirling in eddies and now shooting down over rapids currents until at last at a bend in the river it was thrown upon the beach and being turned over by the concussion the children were rolled out upon the sand the neighboring thickets soon of course resounded with their plaintive cries a mother wolf who was sleeping there came out to see what was the matter now a mother of whatever race is irresistibly drawn by an instinct if incapable of a sentiment of affection to love and to cherish anything that is newly born the wolf caressed the helpless babes imagining perhaps that they were her own offspring and lying down by their side she cherished and fed them watching all the time with a fierce and vigilant eye for any approaching enemy or danger the rude nursery might very naturally be supposed to be in dangerous proximity to the water but it happened that the river when the babes were set adrift in it was very high from the effect of rains upon the mountains and thus soon after the children were thrown upon the land the water began to subside in a short time it wholly returned to its accustomed channel leaving the children on the warm sand high above all danger the wolf was not their only guardian a woodpecker the tradition says watched over them too and brought them berries and other sylvan food the reader will perhaps be disposed to hesitate a little in receiving this last statement for sober history but as no part of the whole narrative will bear any very rigid scrutiny we may as well take the story of the woodpecker along with the rest in a short time the children were rescued from their exposed situation by a shepherd who is called faustulus and may or may not have been the same with the faustulus by whom they had been exposed faustulus carried the children to his hut and there the maternal attentions of the wolf and the woodpecker were replaced by those of the shepherd's wife her name was laurentia faustulus was one of amulius's herdsmen having the care of the flocks and herds that grazed on this part of the royal domain but living like any other shepherd in great seclusion in his hut in the forests he not only rescued the children but he brought home and preserved the trough in which they had been floated down the river he put this relic aside thinking that the day might perhaps come in which there would be occasion to produce it he told the story of the children only to a very few trustworthy friends and he accompanied the communication in the cases where he made it with many injunctions of secrecy he named the fondlings romulus and remus and as they grew up they passed generally for the shepherd's sons faustulus felt a great degree of interest and a high sense of responsibility too in having these young princes under his care 
he took great pains to protect them from all possible harm and to instruct them in everything which it was in those days considered important for young men to know it is even said that he sent them to a town in latium where there was some sort of seminary of learning that their minds might receive a proper intellectual culture as they grew up they were both handsome in form and in countenance and were characterized by a graceful dignity of air and demeanor which made them very attractive in the eyes of all who beheld them they were prominent among the young herdsmen and hunters of the forest for their courage their activity their strength their various personal accomplishments and their high and generous qualities of mind romulus was more silent and thoughtful than his brother and seemed to possess in some respects superior mental powers both were regarded by all who knew them with feeling of the highest respect and consideration romulus and remus treated their own companions and equals that is the young shepherds and herdsmen of the mountain with great courtesy and kindness and were very kindly regarded by them in return they however evinced a great degree of independence of spirit in respect to the various bailiffs and chief herdsmen and other officers of field and forest police who exercised authority in the region where they lived these men were sometimes haughty and domineering and the peasantry in general stood greatly in awe of them romulus and remus however always faced them without fear never seeming to be alarmed at their threats or at any other exhibitions of their anger in fact the boys seemed to be imbued with a native loftiness and fearlessness of character as if they had inherited a spirit of confidence and courage with their royal blood or had imbibed a portion of the indomitable temper of their fierce forest mother they were generous however as well as brave they took the part of the weak and the oppressed against the tyrannical and the strong in the rustic contentions that they witnessed they interposed to help the feeble to relieve those who were in want and to protect the defenseless they hunted wild beasts they fought against robbers they rescued and saved the lost for amusements they practiced running wrestling racing throwing javelins and spears and other athletic feats and accomplishments in everything excelling all their competitors and becoming in the end greatly renowned numator the father of rhea silvia whom amelius had dethroned and banished from alba was all this time still living and he had now at length become so far reconciled to amelius as to be allowed to reside in alba though he lived there as a private citizen he owned it seems some estates near the tiber where he had flocks and herds that were tended by his shepherds and herdsmen it happened at one time that some contention arose between the herdsmen of numitor and those of amulius among whom romulus and remus were residing now as the young man had thus far of course no idea whatever of their relationship to numitor there was no reason why they should feel any special interest in his affairs and they accordingly as might naturally have been expected took part with amelius in this quarrel since faustulus and all the shepherds around them were on that side 
the herdsmen of numitor in the course of the quarrel drove away some of the cattle which were claimed as belongings to the herdsmen of amulius romulus and remus which they hastily called together to pursue the depredators and bring the cattle back they succeeded in this expedition and recaptured the herd this incensed the party of numitor and they determined on revenge they waited some time for a favorable opportunity at length the time came for celebrating a certain festival called the supercalia which consisted of very rude games and ceremonies in which men sacrificed goats and then dressed themselves partially in the skins and ran about wiping every one whom they met with thongs made likewise of the skins of goats or of rabbits or other animals remarkable for their fecundity the meaning of the ceremonies so far as such uncouth and absurd ceremonies could have any meaning was to honor the god of fertility and fruitfulness and to promote the fruitfulness of their flocks and herds during the year ensuing at the time that the celebrations were held the retainers and partisans of numitor determined on availing themselves of this opportunity to accomplish their object accordingly they armed themselves and coming suddenly upon the spot where the shepherds of amulius were celebrating the games they made a rush for remus who was at that time in accordance with the custom running to and fro half naked and armed only with goatskin thongs they succeeded in making him prisoner and bore him away in triumph to numitor of course this daring act produced great excitement throughout the country numitor was well pleased with the prize that he had secured but felt at the same time some fear of the responsibility which he incurred by holding the prisoner he was strongly inclined to proceed against remus and punish him himself for the offences which the herdsmen of his lands charged against him but he finally concluded that this would not be safe and he determined in the end to refer the case to amulius for decision he accordingly sent remus to amulius making grievous charges against him as a lawless desperado who with his brother numitor said were the terror of the forest through their domineering temper and their acts of robbery and rapine the king pleased perhaps with the spirit of deference to his regal authority on the part of his brother implied in the referring of the case of the accused to him for trial sent remus back again to numitor saying that numitor might punish the freebooter himself in any way that he thought best remus was accordingly brought again to numitor's house in the meantime the fact of his being thus made a prisoner and charged with crime and the proceedings in relation to him in sending him back and forth between amulius and numitor strongly attracted public attention every one was talking of the prisoner and discussing the question of his probable fate the general interest which was thus awakened in respect to him and to his brother romulus revived the slumbering recollections in the minds of the old neighbors of faustulus of the stories which he had told them of his having found the twins on the bank of the river in their infancy they told this story to romulus and he or some other friends made it known to remus while he was still confined when remus was brought before numitor who was really his grandfather though the fact of this relationship was wholly unknown to both of them numitor was exceedingly struck with his handsome countenance and form 
and with his fearless and noble demeanor. The young prisoner seemed perfectly self-possessed and at his ease, and though he knew well that his life was at stake, there was a certain air of calmness and composure in his manner, which seemed to denote very lofty qualities both of person and mind. A vague recollection of the lost children of his daughter Rhea immediately flashed across Numitor's mind. It changed all his anger against Remus to a feeling of wondering, interest, and curiosity, and gave to his countenance as he looked upon his prisoner an expression of kind and tender regard. After a short pause, Numitor addressed the young captive, speaking in a gentle, conciliating manner, and asked him who he was and who his parents were. I will frankly tell you all that I know, said Remus, since you treat me in so fair and honorable a manner. The king delivered me up to be punished without listening to what I had to say, but you seem willing to hear before you condemn. My name is Remus, and I have a twin brother named Romulus. We have always supposed ourselves to be the children of Faustulus, but now, since this difficulty has occurred, we have heard new tidings in respect to our origin. We are told that we were found in our infancy on the shore of the river at the place where Faustulus lives, and that nearby there was a box or trough in which we had been floated down to the spot from a place above. When Faustulus found us, there was a wolf and a woodpecker taking care of us and bringing us food. Faustulus carried us to his house and brought us up as his children. He preserved the trough, too, and has it now. Numitor was, of course, greatly excited at hearing this intelligence. He perceived at once that the finding of these children, both in respect to time and place, and to all the attendant circumstances, corresponded so precisely with the exposure of the children of Rhea Silvia as to leave no reasonable ground for doubt that Romulus and Remus were his grandsons. He resolved immediately to communicate this joyful discovery to his daughter, if he could contrive the means of gaining access to her, for during all this time she had been kept in close confinement in her prison. In the meantime, Romulus himself, at the house of Faustulus, in the forest had become greatly excited by the circumstances in which he found himself placed. He had been very much incensed at the capture of Remus, and while concerting with Faustulus plans for rescuing him, Faustulus had explained to him the mystery of his birth. He had informed him not only how he was found with his brother by the bank of the river, but also had made known to him whose sons he and Remus were. Romulus was, of course, extremely elated at this intelligence. His native courage and energy were quickened anew by his learning that he and his brother were princes, and, as he believed, rightfully entitled to the throne he immediately began to form plans for raising a rebellion against the government of Amulius, with a view of first rescuing Remus from his power and afterward taking such ulterior steps as circumstances might require. Faustulus, on the other hand, leaving Romulus to raise the forces for his insurrection as he pleased, determined to go himself to Numitor, and revealed the secret of the birth of Romulus and Remus to him. In order to confirm and corroborate his story, he took the trough with him, carrying it under his cloak, in order 
to conceal it from view, and in this manner made his appearance at the gates of Alba. There was something in his appearance and manner when he arrived at the gate which attracted the attention of the officers on guard there. He wore the dress of a countryman, and had obviously come in from the forest a long way, and there was something in his air which denoted hurry and agitation. The soldiers asked him what he had under his cloak, and compelled him to produce the ark to view. The curiosity of the guardsmen was still more strongly aroused, and seeing this old relic it was bound with brass bands and it had some rude inscription marked upon it it happened that one of the guard was an old soldier who had been in some way connected with the exposure of the children of rhea when they were set adrift in the river and he immediately recognized this trough as the float which they had been placed in he immediately concluded that some very extraordinary movement was going on, and he determined to proceed forthwith and inform Amulius of what he had discovered. He accordingly went to the king and informed him that a man had been intercepted at the gate of the city who was attempting to bring in, concealed under his cloak, the identical ark or float which, to his certain knowledge, had been used in the case of the children of Rhea Silvia, for sending them adrift on the waters of the Tiber. The king was greatly excited and agitated at receiving this intelligence. He ordered Faustulus to be brought into his presence. Faustulus was much terrified at receiving this summons. He had but little time to reflect what to say, and during the few minutes that elapsed while they were conducting him into the presence of the king he found it hard to determine how much it would be best for him to admit and how much to deny finally in answer to the interrogations of the king he acknowledged that he found the children and the ark in which they had been drifted upon the shore and that he had saved the boys alive, and had brought them up as his children. He said, however, that he did not know where they were. They had gone away, he alleged, some years before, and were now living as shepherds in some distant part of the country. He did not know exactly where. Amulius then asked Faustulus, what he had been intending to do with the trough which he was bringing so secretly into the city faustulus said that he was going to carry it to rhea in her prison she having often expressed a strong desire to see it as a token or memorial which would recall the dear babes that had lain in it very vividly to her mind Amalia seemed satisfied that these statements were honest and true, but they awakened in his mind a very great solicitude and anxiety. He feared that the children, being still alive, might some day come to the knowledge of their origin and so disturb his possession of the throne, and perhaps revenge by some dreadful retaliation the wrongs and injuries which he had inflicted upon their mother and their grandfather. The people, he feared, would be very much inclined to take part with them and not with him in any contest which might arise, for their sympathies were already on the side of Numitor, in a word he was greatly alarmed, and he was much at a loss to know what to do to avert the danger which was impending over him. He concluded to send to Numitor and inquire of him whether he was aware that the boys were still alive, and if so, if he knew where they were to be found. He accordingly sent a messenger to his brother, commissioned to make these inquiries. This messenger, though in the service of Amulius, was really a friend to Numitor,
and on being admitted to Numitor's presence, when he went to make the inquiries as directed by the king, he found Remus there, though not as he had expected, in the attitude of a prisoner awaiting sentence from a judge, but rather in that of a son in affectionate consultation with his father. He soon learned the truth and immediately expressed his determination to espouse the cause of the prince. The whole city will be on your side, said he to Remus. You have only to place yourself at the head of the population and proclaim your rights, and you will easily be restored to the possession of them. Just at this crisis a tumult was heard at the gates of the city. Romulus had arrived there at the head of a band of peasants and herdsmen that he had collected in the forest. These insurgents were rudely armed and were organized in a very simple and primitive manner. For weapons, the peasants bore such implements of agriculture as could be used for weapons. While the huntsmen brought their pikes and spears and javelins and such other projectiles as were employed in those days in hunting wild beasts. The troop was divided into companies of one hundred, and for banners they bore tufts of green on wisps of straw or fern or other herbage, tied at the top of a pole. The armament was rude, but the men were resolute, and determined and they made their appearance at the gates of the city upon the outside just in time to cooperate with remus in the rebellion which he had raised within the revolt was successful a revolt is generally successful against a despot when the great mass of the population desire his downfall amulius made a desperate attempt to stem the torrent but his hour had come. His palace was stormed, and he was slain. The revolution was complete, and Romulus and Remus were masters of the country. End of chapter 8 Recording by Simon Wainwright Chapter 9 of Romulus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by HearHis.com. Romulus by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 9 The Founding of Rome. B.C. 754. As soon as the excitement and the agitations which attended the sudden revolution by which Amulus was dethroned were in some measure calmed, and tranquillity was restored, the question of the mode in which the new government should be settled arose. Nimitor considered it best that he should call an assembly of the people and lay the subject before them. There was a very large portion of the population who yet knew nothing certain in respect to the causes of the extraordinary events that had occurred. The city was filled with strange rumors, in all of which truth and falsehood were inextricably mingled, so that they increased rather than allayed the general curiosity and wonder. Nimitor accordingly convened a general assembly of all the inhabitants of Alba in a public square. The rude and rustic mountaineers and peasants whom Romulus had brought to the city came with the rest. Romulus and Remus themselves did not at first appear. Numitor, when the audience was assembled, came forward to address them. He gave them a recital of all the events connected with the usurpation of Romulus. He told them of the original division, which had been made thirty or forty years before, of the kingdom and the estates of his father, between Amulus and himself, of the plans and intrigues by which Amulus had contrived to possess himself of the kingdom and reduce him, Numitor, into subjection to his sway, 
of his causing Agustus, Numitor's son, to be slain in the hunting party, and then compelling his little daughter Rhea to become a vestal virgin in order that she might never be married, and then went on to describe the birth of Romulus and Remus, the anger of Amulus when informed of the event, his cruel treatment of the children and of the mother, and his orders that the babes should be drowned in the Tiber. He gave an account of the manner in which the infants had been put into the little wooden ark, of their floating down the stream, and finally landing on the bank, and of their being rescued, protected, and fed by the wolf and the woodpecker. He closed his speech by saying that the young princes were still alive, and that they were then at hand ready to present themselves before the assembly. As he said these words, Romulus and Remus came forward, and the vast assembly, after gazing for a moment in silent wonder upon their tall and graceful forms, in which they saw combined athletic strength and vigor with manly beauty, they burst into long and loud acclamations. As soon as the applause had in some measure subsided, Romulus and Remus turned to their grandfather and hailed him king. The people responded to this announcement with new plaudits, and Numitor was universally recognized as the rightful sovereign. It seems that notwithstanding the personal graces and accomplishments of Romulus and Remus, and that popularity among their fellow foresters, and they and their followers made a somewhat rude and wild appearance in the city, and Numitor was very willing, when the state of things had become somewhat settled, that his rustic auxiliaries should find some occasion for withdrawing from the capital and returning again to their own native fastness. Romulus and Remus, however, having now learned that they were entitled to the regal name, naturally felt desirous of possessing a little regal power, and thus desired to remain in the city while still they had to do much consideration for their grandfather to wish to deprive him of the government. After some deliberation, a plan was devised which promised to gratify the wishes of all. The plan was this, namely, that Numitor should set apart a palace in his kingdom of Latum, where Romulus and Remus might build a city for themselves, taking with them to the spot the whole horde of their retainers. The place which he designated for this purpose was the spot on the banks of the Tiber, where the two children had been landed upon floating down the stream. It was a wild and romantic region, and the enterprise of building a city upon it was one exactly suited to engage the attention and occupy the powers of such restless spirits as those who had collected under the young prince's standard. Many of these men, it is true, were shepherds and herdsmen, well disposed in mind, though rude and rough in manners. But then there were many others of a very turbulent and unmanageable character, outlaws, fugitives, and adventurers of every description, who had fled to the woods to escape punishment for former crimes, or seek opportunities for the commission of new deeds of rapine and robbery and who had seized upon the occasion furnished by the insurrection against Amulus, to come forth into the world again. Criminals always flock into armies when armies are raised, for war presents to the wicked and depraved all the charms, with but half the danger of a life of crime. War is in fact ordinarily only a legal organization of crime. Romulus and Remus entered into their grandfather's plan with great readiness. Numitor promised to aid them in their enterprise by every means in his power. He was to furnish tools and implements for excavations and building, and artisans so far as artisans were required, and was also to provide such temporary supplies of provisions and stores as might be required at the outset of the undertaking. He gave permission also to any of his subjects to join Romulus and Remus in their undertaking, 
and they, in order to increase their numbers as much as possible, sent messengers around to the neighboring country inviting all who were disposed to come and take part of the building of the new city. This invitation was accepted by great numbers of people from every rank and station in life. Of course, however, the greater portion of those who came to join the enterprise were of a very low grade in respect to moral character. Men of industry, integrity, and moral worth who possessed kind hearts and warm domestic affections were generally well and prosperously settled each in his own hamlet or town, and were little inclined to break away from the ties which bound them to friends and society in order to plunge into such a scene of turmoil and confusion as the building of a new city under such circumstances must necessarily be. It was, of course, generally the discontented, the idle, and the bad that would hope for benefit from such a change at this enterprise proposed to them. Every restless and desperate spirit, every depraved victim of vice, every fugitive and outlaw would be ready to embark in such a scheme, which was to create certainly a new phase in their relations to society, and thus afford them an opportunity to make a fresh beginning. The enterprise, at the same time, seemed to offer them, through a new organization and new laws, some prospect of release from responsibility for former crimes. In a word, in preparing to lay the foundations of their city, Romulus and Remus found themselves at the head of a very wild and lawless company. There were seven district hills on the ground which was subsequently included within the limits of Rome. Between and among these hills the river meandered by sweeping and graceful curves, and at one point, near the center of what is now the city, the stream passed very near the foot of one of the elevations called the Palatine Hill. Here was the spot where the wooden ark in which Romulus and Remus had been set adrift had been thrown up upon the shore. The sides of the hill were steep, and between it and the river there was in one part a deep morass. Romulus thought, on surveying the ground with Remus, his brother, that this was the best spot for building the city. They could set apart a sufficient space of level ground around the foot of the hill for houses, enclosing the whole with a wall, while the top of the hill itself might be fortified to form the citadel. The wall and the steep acclivity of the ground would form a protection on three sides of the enclosure, while the morass alone would be a sufficient defense on the part toward the river. Then Romulus was especially desirous to select this spot as the site, as it was here that he and his brother had been saved from destruction in so wonderful a manner. Situation of Rome Remus, however, did not concur in these views. A little further down the stream there was another elevation, called the Avitine Hill, which seemed to him more suitable for the site of a town. The sides were less precipitous, and thus were more convenient for building ground. Then the land in the immediate vicinity was better adapted to the purposes which they had in view. In a word, the Aventine Hill was, as Remus thought, for every substantial reason, much the best locality, and as for the fact of their having been washed ashore at the foot of the other hill, it was, in his opinion, an insignificant circumstance, wholly unworthy of being taken seriously into the account in laying the foundation of a city. The positions in which Remus and Romulus stood in respect to each other, and the feelings which were naturally awakened in their hearts by the circumstances in which they found themselves placed, were such as did not tend to allay any rising asperity which accident might occasion, but rather to irritate and inflame it. In the first place, they were both adrant, impulsive, and imperious. Each was conscious of his strength and eager to exercise it. Each wished to command, and was wholly unwilling to obey. While they were in adversity, they clung together for mutual help and protection. But now, when they had come into the enjoyment of prosperity and power, the bands of affection which had bound them together were very much weakened, and were finally sundered. Then there was nothing whatever to mark any superiority of one over the other, and 
If they had been of different ages, the younger could have yielded to the elder, in some degree, without wounding his pride. If one had been more prominent than the other in effecting the revolution by which Amulus was dethroned, or if there had been a native difference of temperament or character to mark a distinction, or if either had been designated by Numitor or selected by popular choice for the command, all might have been well. But there seemed, in fact, to be between them no grounds of distinction whatever. They were twins, so they neither could claim any advantage of birthright. They were equal in size, strength, activity, and courage. They had been equally bold and efficient in effecting the revolution, and now seemed equally powerful in respect to the influence with which they wielded over the minds of their followers. We have been so long accustomed to consider Romulus the more distinguished personage, through the associations connected with his name, that have arisen from his subsequent career, that it is difficult for us to place him and his brother on that footing of perfect equality which they occupied in the estimation of all who knew them in this part of their history. This equality had caused no difference between them thus far, but now, since the advert of power and prosperity prevented their continuing longer on the level, there necessarily came up for decision the terrible question, terrible when two such spirits as theirs have to decide, which was to yield the palm. The brothers, therefore, having each expressed his preference in respect to the best place for the city, were equally unwilling to recede from the ground which they had taken. Remus thought that there was no reason why he should yield to Romulus, and Romulus was equally unwilling to give way to Remus. Neither could yield, in fact, without in some sense admitting the superiority of the other. The respective partisans of the two leaders began to take sides, and the dissension threatened to become a serious quarrel. Finally, being not yet quite ready for an open rupture, they concluded to refer the question to Nimeter, and to abide by his decision. They expected that he would come and view the ground, and so decide where it was best that the city should be built and thus terminate the controversy. But Numitor was too sagacious to hazard the responsibility of deciding between two such equally matched and powerful opponents. He endeavored to soothe and quiet the excited feelings of his grandsons, and finally recommended to them to appeal to augury to decide the question. Augury was a mode of ascertaining the divine will in respect to questions of expediency or duty by means of certain pronostications and signs. These omens were of various kinds, but perhaps the most common were the appearances observed in watching the flight of birds through the air. It was agreed between Remus and Romulus, in accordance with the advice of Numitor, that the question at issue between them should be decided in this way. They were to take their stations on the two hills respectively, the Palatine and the Abatine, and watch for vultures. The homes of the vultures of Italy were among the summits of the Apennines, and their function in the complicated economy of animal life was to watch from the lofty peaks of mountains or from the still more aerial and commanding positions which they found in soaring at vast elevations in the air for the bodies of the dead, whether of men after a battle, or of a sheep, or cattle, or wild beasts of the forest, killed by accident or dying of age, and when found to remove and devour them, and thus to hasten the return of the lifeless elements to other forms of animal and vegetable life. What the earth and the rite of burial effects for man in advanced and cultivated stages of society, the vultures of the Apennines were commissioned to perform for all the animal communities of Italy in Numitor's time. To enable the vulture to accomplish the work assigned him, he is endowed with an inconceivable strength of wing to sustain his flight over the vast distances which he has to traverse, and up to the vast elevations to which he must sometimes soar, and also, with some mysterious and extraordinary sense, whether of sight or smell, to enable him readily to find, at any hour, the spot where his presence is required, 
however remote or however hidden it may be. Guided by this instinct, he flies from time to time with a company of his fellows, from mountain to mountain, or wheels slowly in vast circles over the plains, surveying the whole surface of the ground, and assuredly finding his work, finding it too equally easily, whether it lie exposed in the open field or is hidden, no matter how secretly, in forest, thicket, grove, or glen. It was to certain appearances indicated in the flight of these birds, such as the number that were seen at a time, the quarter of the heavens in which they appeared, the direction in which they flew, as from left to right, or from right to left, that the people of Numitor's day were accustomed to look for omens and arguries. So Romulus and Remus took their stations on the hills to which they had severely chosen, and surrounded by a company of his own adherents and friends, and began to watch the skies. It was agreed that the decision of the question between the two hills should be determined by the omens which should appear to the respective observers stationed upon them. But it happened, unfortunately, that the rules for the interpretation of auguries and omens were far too indefinite and vague to answer the purpose for which they were now appealed to. The most unequivocal distinctness and directness in giving its responses is a very essential requisite in any tribunal that is called upon as an umpire to settle disputes, while the ancient auguries and oracles were always susceptible of a great variety of interpretations. When Remus and Romulus commenced their watch, no vultures were to be seen from either hill. They waited till evening. Still none appeared. They continued to watch through the night. In the morning a messenger came over from the Palatine Hill to Remus on the Avertine, informing him that vultures had appeared to Romulus. Remus did not believe it. At last, however, the birds really came into view. A flock of six were seen by Remus, and afterward one of twelve by Romulus. The observations were then suspended, and the parties came together to confer in respect to the results. But the dispute, instead of being settled, was found to be in a worse condition than ever. The point now to be determined was whether six vultures seen first, or twelve seen afterward, were the better omen. That is whether numbers, or simply priority of appearance, should decide the question. In continuing in respect to this nice point, the brothers became more angry with each other than ever. Their respective partisans took sides in the contest, which resulted finally in an open and violent collision. Romulus and Remus themselves seemed to have been commenced the affray by attacking one another. Fastulius, their foster-father, who, from having had the care of them from their earliest infancy, felt for them an almost parental affection, rushed between them to prevent them from shedding each other's blood. He was struck down and killed on the spot by some unknown hand. A brother of Fastulius, too, named Listinus, who had lived near to him, and had known the boys from their infancy, and had often assisted in taking care of them, was killed in the endeavor to aid his brother to appease the tumult. At length the disturbance was quelled. The result of the conflict was, however, to show that Romulus and his party were the strongest. Romulus, accordingly, went on to build the walls of the city at the spot which he had first chosen. The lines were marked out, and the excavations were commenced with great ceremony. In laying out the work, the first thing to be done was to draw the lines of what was called the porarium. The porarium was a sort of symbolic wall, and was formed simply by turning a furrow with the plow all around the city. At a considerable distance from the real walls, for the purpose not of establishing lines of defense, but of marking out what were to be the limits of the corporation, so to speak, for legal and ceremonial purposes. Of course, the porimium included a much greater space than the real walls, and the people were allowed to build houses anywhere within this outer enclosure, or even without it, though not very near to it. Those who built were thus, of course, not protected in case of an attack, 
and, of course, they would in such case be compelled to abandon their houses and retreat for safety within the proper walls. So Romulus proceeded to mark out the perimium of the city, employing in the work the ceremonies customary on such occasions. The plough used was made of copper, and for a team to draw it a bullock and heifer were yoked together. Men appointed for the purpose followed the plough, and carefully turned over the clods toward the wall of the city. This seems to have been considered an essential part of the ceremony. At the places where roads were to pass in toward the gates of the city, the plough was lifted out of the ground and carried over the requisite space, so as to leave the turf at those points unbroken. This was a necessary precaution, for there was a certain consecrating influence that was exerted by this ceremonial ploughing, which hallowed the ground wherever it passed in a manner that would very seriously interfere with its usefulness as a public road. The form of the space enclosed by the pararium, as Romulus ploughed it, was nearly square, and it included not merely the Palatine Hill itself, but a considerable portion of level land around it. Though Romulus thus seemed to have conquered, in the strife with Remus, the difficulty was not yet fully settled. Remus was very little disposed to acquiesce in his brother's assumed superiority over him. He was sullen, morose, and ill at ease, and was inclined to take little part at the proceedings which were going on. Finally, an occasion occurred which produced a crisis and brought the rivalry and enmity of the brothers suddenly and forever to an end. Remus was one day standing by a part of the wall which his brother's workmen were building, and expressing in various ways and with great freedom his opinions of his brother's plans, and finally he began to speak contemptuously of the wall which the workmen were building. Romulus all the time was standing by. At length, in order to enforce what he said about the insufficiency of the work, Remus leaped over a portion of it, saying, This is the way the enemy will leap over your wall. Hereupon Romulus seized a mattox from the hands of one of the laborers and struck his brother down to the ground with it, saying, And this is the way that we will kill them if they do. Remus was killed by the blow. As soon as the deed was done, Romulus was at once overwhelmed with remorse and horror at the atrocity of the crime which he had been so suddenly led to commit. His anguish was so great for a time that he refused all food, and he could not sleep. He caused the body of Remus, and also those of Festulius and Listinus, the brother of Festulius, to be buried with the most solemn and imposing funeral ceremonies, so as to render all possible honor to their memory, and then, not satisfied with this, he instituted and celebrated certain religious rites to prevent the ghosts of the deceased from coming back to haunt him. The ghosts, or specters of the dead that came back to haunt and terrify the living, were called the Lumures. Hence, the celebration which Romulus ordained was called the Lumeria, and it continued to be annually observed in Rome during the whole period of its subsequent history. Precisely what the ceremonies were which Romulus performed to appease the spirit of his brother can not now be ascertained, as there was no particular description of them recorded, but the Lumeria, as afterward performed, were frequently described by Roman writers, and they were of very curious and extraordinary character. The time for the celebration of these rites was in May, the anniversary, as was supposed, of the days in which Romulus originally celebrated them. The lemurial ceremonies extended through three days, or rather nights, although, for some curious reason or other, they were alternate and not consecutive nights. They were the nights of the ninth, eleventh, and thirteenth of May. The ceremonies were performed in the night for the reason that it was in the dark hours that the ghosts and goblins were accustomed, as was supposed, to roam about the world to haunt and terrify men. The ceremonies performed on these occasions are thus described. They commenced at midnight. The father of the family would rise at that hour and go out at the door of the house, making certain gestulations and signals with his hands, 
which were supposed to have the effect of keeping the specters away. He then washed his hands three times in pure spring water. Then he filled his mouth with a certain kind of black beans for which ghosts were supposed to have some particular fondness. Being thus provided, he would walk along, taking the beans out of his mouth as he walked, throwing them behind him. The specters were supposed to gather up these beans as he threw them down. He must, however, by no means look round to see them. He then, after speaking certain mysterious and cabalistic words, washed his hands again, and then, making a frightful noise by striking brass basins together, he shouted out nine times, Ghost of this house, be gone! This was supposed effectually to drive the specters away, an opinion which was always abundantly confirmed by the fact, for on looking round after this vociferated adjuration, the man always found that the specters were gone. When by these ceremonies, or ceremonies such as these, Romulus had appeased the spirit of his brother, and those of the guardians of his childhood, his mind became more composed, and he turned his attention once more toward the building of the city. The party of Remus now, of course, since it was deprived of its head, no longer maintained itself, but was gradually broken up and merged in the general mass. Romulus became the sole leader of the enterprise, and immediately turned his attention to the measures to be adopted for a more complete and effectual organization of the community over which he found himself presiding. In respect to Remus, it ought perhaps to be added, that after his death a story was circulated in Rome, that it was a man named Seller, not Romulus, that killed him. This story has not, however, been generally believed. It has been thought more probable that Romulus himself, or some of his partisans and friends, invented and circulated the story of Seller, in order to screen him in some degree from the reproach of so unnatural a crime as the killing of a brother so near and dear to him as Remus had been, a brother who had shared his infancy with him, who had slept with him at the same time in the arms of his mother, who had floated with him down the Tiber in the same ark, been saved from death by the same miraculous intervention, and through all the years of infancy, childhood, and youth, had been his constant playmate, companion, and friend. The crime was as much more atrocious than any ordinary fratricide, as Remus had been nearer to Romulus than any ordinary brother. End of chapter 9 Recorded by hearhis.com